It's natural to wonder why bad things happen to good people, or for that matter, why good things happen to bad people. Why would God, who is just, allow that? Questions like these are explored through the experience of Job, one of those good people to whom bad things happened. Because of Job's trials, his friends wondered if he really was good after all. Job asserted his own righteousness and wondered if God is really just after all. But despite his suffering and wondering, Job maintained his integrity and faith in Jesus Christ. In the book of Job, faith is questioned and tested, but never completely abandoned. That doesn't mean that all of the questions are answered, but the book of Job teaches that until they are answered, Questions and faith can coexist, and regardless of what happens in the meantime, we can say of our Lord, yet will I trust in him. Perhaps at this point it'd be good for us just perhaps at this point it'd be good for us just to maybe do a reader's digest condensed version of the story. One of you want to tackle that just to kinda of why don't you do that, Richard? Why don't you summarize the, the story? For uh, us? All right. First of all we have uh, in uh, chapter one the setup. Uh, wherein the sons of God are met together. Uh, I like to think of it as priesthood session of general conference, okay? <laughs> and lo and behold, who, sh who shows up but Satan himself, who then challenges God. And, and God allows the challenge to stand and says, okay, Satan, you can have your way with Job up to a point. And then the sufferings commence. Uh, chapters 3 through 14 are the first uh, cycle of... Uh, talks uh, where Job's friends, his three friends, Eliphaz and so Bildad and Zophar. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, this, love this, friends this, like that. Yeah, no, this, this is the, uh, the, the place where the phrase with friends like that who needs enemies yeah. comes from. But we have the first uh, cycle of uh, speakers, uh, chapters 3 through 14. Uh, Eliphaz speaks. Job re rebuts, uh, Bildad speaks, Job rebuts, then Zophar speaks, Job rebuts. And what, what's the essence of what they're telling Job? Uh, you're a sinner. Yeah. Uh, you will not recognize that you are the cause of your misery, and that itself shows that you're a sinner. Or your children, right? Doesn't uh, um, well, Bildad yeah, does. your children must have sinned, otherwise mm -hmm. they would have been wiped out. Yeah, exactly right. So and that's the essence, and then Job, Job successfully, I believe he successfully counters them and all that. And so then we have the second cycle, where we have Eliphaz making the claims, Job answering, Bildad, Job answering, Zophar, uh, and so on. Then finally, we have to go through a third cycle, as if that hasn't been enough. And this time we got Eliphaz and Bildad. I think Zophar's had it by that time. He doesn't have a thing to say in the third cycle. And then, right at the end, right when we think we've gone through, along comes this, uh, I don't know, upstart, this young man. He's been listening to the whole thing. He's been a teenager. He's got it, all the he, he, he really <laughs> does. <laughs> yeah, very good. Elihu comes up, and, and he just really blasts Job and the others. I mean, everybody's in, in his sights. He, he blasts them all. And yet he has a kernel of something. Well, he does. And we ought to talk about that when we, and we're, when we get over there. And then, uh, when everything's said and done, when everybody said their piece, then and God comes on the uh, stage and God addresses Job and Job's concerned. And then in the end, why we see the blessings that come to Job because of his endurance. Now that's, a, that's in a nutshell. Well, well, yeah. And it's interesting to me that the conclusion, the wrong conclusion that the friends come up to yeah. is that all the suffering is based on sin. That they cannot ever move away from the idea that you suffer because of sin. And I fear that sometimes we judge ourselves on that basis. Something comes along, a hiccup in our life, some kind of troubles, financial troubles, job troubles, even uh, troubles within our family. And you know, it's because somehow we've sinned. And maybe we need to back away from that a little bit and, and trust the Lord and uh, trust our own faithfulness to the Lord as Job does all the way through. They are never able to pull him away from his trust in the Lord. You know, it's, it's almost like the friends are trying to answer one question and Job's answering the question that they should have asked. The, friend, no. the, the question the friends are trying to ask, answer is, why do the righteous suffer? And, and Job Job's instead is trying to how say, do you suffer? How, how do you suffer? How do you suffer right. And still stay faithful. We can remain faithful to the Lord as did Job. Here are some examples of what he did uh, in explaining how he was able to remain faithful. 
in Job chapter 1, verse 21. And Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in Job chapter 2, verse 10, he says, But Job said unto her, his wife, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. We continue in Job uh, chapter 12. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and breath of all mankind? With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. And finally in Job chapter 13. Though he may slay me, yet I will trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Life is not good for me, yet I know that God is in charge. So if we can read in Job chapter 19, verses 20 through 26, he says the following, My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do you persecute me as God, and, not, and are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were now written, oh, that they were printed in a book that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. God's perspective is greater than ours. We can read in Job chapter 38 the following. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Job had complete faith in God's power to save, just like we need to have complete faith as Job did. And we can read this in Job chapter 14. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call, and I will answer. Thou will have a desire to the work of thine hands. For now thou numberest my steps. Dost thou not watch over my sin? My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest or coverest up mine iniquity. The phrase, to sealed up in a bag, is shut up in eternal oblivion. That is, God, therefore, will think no more of my former sins. To cover sins is to completely forgive them. We can read this in Psalms. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. We don't know for certain who wrote the Psalms. Some have been attributed to King David, but for most of them, the writers remain anonymous. Yet, after reading the Psalms, we may feel as if we know the hearts of the psalmists, even if we don't know their names. What we do know is that the Psalms were an important part of worship among the Israelites, and we know that the Savior quoted uh, them often. In the Psalms, we get a window into the soul of God's ancient people. We see how they felt about God, what they worried about, and how they found peace. As believers today, all over the world, we still use these words in our worship of God. The writers of the Psalms seem to have had a window into our souls 
and seem to have found a way to express how we feel about God, what we worry about, and how we find peace. We've been talking about poetry in the Bible, how biblical poets love design and masterfully use metaphor and symbolism. These poems invite us into an experience, to ponder ideas slowly and from many angles. And the largest collection of poetry in the Bible is the book of Psalms. So that's what we're going to look at here. Now, the Israelites composed lots of poetry throughout their history. Yeah, poems were written by Israelites, sages, kings, and prophets. Some poems were sung by choirs in the Jerusalem temple, while others were prayed by families at home. And over the centuries, the most important and widely read poems were compiled together to be read or sung on special occasions. And I'm familiar with books of poetry, a large collection of the greatest poems in one place, and I can read through and pick my favorites. But the Book of Psalms isn't that kind of collection. Here, each poem has been expertly crafted and then placed where it is for a reason, to create a storyline from the book's beginning to its end. The Psalms poetically retell the entire biblical story, and they invite you into a literary temple. A literary temple? Yeah, so the tabernacle and then later the temple in Jerusalem were where ancient Israelites went to meet with God. When you arrived, you would see art and imagery everywhere. You'd see priests performing rituals. You'd hear songs and prayers, all of it symbolically proclaiming that your God rules the world from this mountain and you're in his living room. So the temple was a place to be in God's presence and also to immerse yourself in the story of God's kingdom. Exactly. And so try to imagine how traumatic it was when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, plundered and burned the temple, and then took many Israelites into exile. Yeah, where can they go now to meet with God, to sing their story and say their prayers? That's where the book of Psalms comes in. It's a prayer book for exiles designed as a virtual temple. You enter the Psalms to meet with God and to hear the entire biblical story of God's kingdom sung back to you in poetry. Cool, but how does the Psalms do it? Let's start with the book's design. There are 150 poems broken up into five clear sections. At the beginning, there's been placed a short introduction, Psalms 1 and 2, which lay out the main themes of the whole book by reviewing the biblical storyline. Okay. Psalm 1 looks back to the Garden of Eden and its river of life. Yeah, God placed humanity in a garden temple. And here, humans decide to define good and evil on their own terms, and so are exiled from the garden. But the first psalm paints a portrait of hope, about an upright human who delights in God's wisdom, which is called Torah, or instruction. This person is like the tree of life in the garden temple. They eternally blossom because they're planted in the river of God's life. Yeah, that's beautiful, but who's it supposed to be? Well, remember that story in Genesis? After humanity's foolish rebellion, God made a promise. Oh right, a future human, the seed of the woman who would come and defeat evil and restore the world. And that's what Psalm 2 is about. God's promise that a king would come from the line of David. He's called the Son of God and the Messiah. God appoints him to bring justice on human evil and to restore God's kingdom and peace over the nations. So Psalms 1 and 2 introduce all these main themes. Yes, and then the book develops those themes through the five sections. The first two explore the complicated story of David and his royal family. The third section focuses on the tragedy of Israel's exile and the downfall of David's royal line. But then the fourth and fifth sections rekindle the hope for the Messiah, a new temple, and God's kingdom on the other side of the exile. Then the book ends with a five-part conclusion, praising God for his faithfulness. Cool. Now, nearly half of the Psalms are connected to one guy, King David, who God chose to rule Israel. Yes, David's story is really important in this book. He experienced many times of hardship, but he trusted God with radical faith. And in these poems, David shares his fears, confesses his failures, and offers thanks to his Redeemer. And he's constantly speaking of a deep longing to be in God's presence in the temple. But wait, David lived before the temple was even built. Exactly. This portrait of David, hoping and praying for God's kingdom and a future temple, it resembles the hopes of the later generations of the exiles. And so David's prayers could become theirs as well. David's like a prayer coach, giving us words for how to pray and how to discover God's presence in good times and bad. Exactly. There are 73 poems connected to David, but most of the rest come from later generations of biblical poets, and they have learned to pray and hope like David. And so the end result is the book of Psalms, designed as a virtual temple for all generations of God's people. 
This isn't a kind of book you just read once and put down. No, it's designed for a lifetime of slow rereading and reflection. These prayers and laments and songs of praise are meant to become our own. They're poems for exiles who are learning to live by God's wisdom and to seek God's justice in the world as they hope for the coming Messiah and the kingdom of God. Uh, by the way, uh, by the way, the reason this book, the Psalms, is the most quoted book in the New Testament is because it refers to Him right. as much as any other source. Uh, uh, one um, incident from the New Testament. Remember where the two disciples are walking along on the road to Emmaus? Mm -hmm. Jesus opened up the scriptures to their understanding and they felt their hearts burning. There was something happening spiritually. But one line, this is Luke 24, 44 says, he said unto them, the Savior, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, the Torah, mm -hmm. the books of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, three concerning me, the, the Hebrew Bible is divided in those three parts. But he, he singles out, see the law is a number of books. The uh, prophets, all the historical books and the prophets, that's another section, but he singles out one, one. Right. representing the, the literary book work. It's all by itself. As the work that uh, shows him, and there's so much said. The Psalms points us to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Here's a couple examples. In Psalms chapter 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now if we compare that to the, in the New Testament in the book of Acts uh, chapter 13, But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up for, with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Another example, Psalms 22, uh, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? compare that to Matthew chapter 27. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sakthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There are a few more examples of the Psalms pointing to Christ. Psalm 78.2, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Compare that to Matthew chapter 13. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundations of the world. Another example, Psalms. 118 verse 26 blessed be he that cometh in the name of the lord we have blessed you out of the house of the lord and in the joseph smith matthew chapter 21 <clears throat> and the multitudes that went before and also that followed after cried saying hosanna to the son of david blessed is he who cometh in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest and another example is in psalms 22 verse 18 they Part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. Matthew chapter 27. And they cried, uh, and they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. The Apostle Paul quotes from Psalms quite extensively, and this is from um, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, and look what he does and how he hybridizes many portions of Psalms into these couplets. And this is taken from the Joseph Smith translation. But this is false. If not so, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have proved before the Jew and Gentiles are all under sin, 
as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's taken from Psalms 14. Then he's going to go to Psalms 5. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. Then he's going to go to Psalms 140. The poison of asp is under their lips. Then he's going to go to Psalms 10, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Then he's going to go all the way over to Isaiah chapter 59. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. And finally, he'll then complete this by quoting from Psalms 36. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So notice he's taking the parts of the body, throat and tongues, lips, mouth, feet, and eyes. Finally, now we know that what things soever the Lord of the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. As part of the shepherd lesson, I did want to look at one thing in the wilderness that will maybe surprise you a bit. Believe it or not, this is called wilderness, midbar, but it's also called green pastures. Now, when you take a Westerner here the first time and you look at this, you find people say, well, I don't know that I can go there because the Psalm 23, the Lord leads me into green pastures has been pictured as belly deep alfalfa. Well, you haven't seen any belly deep alfalfa. And from biblical time to today, it's rare to see a flock in the farm country. There isn't a lot of farm country in this culture. And so farmers kept the shepherds out as much as they could. Maybe they would come in a little bit after the harvest to glean what was left, but you don't want sheep where you can farm. This is the land of the shepherd. Right on the hillside across from us, you can see those grazing trails cut there by sheep maybe as long ago as Abraham's time. They're spaced so that an animal on one path and an animal on another can reach right to the middle between them. That determines the distance so you can graze an entire hillside. And the shepherds lead their sheep across that hillside slowly grazing what's there. Now you look at it from here and you say, what's there? In fact, I remember my first impression. I woke up one morning, I was sleeping out in the wilderness, and I remember waking up watching a flock of sheep on a hillside like this, and my, re my feeling was, what are those rock-eating sheep? I mean, what do they eat? How can you call this green pastures? Well, the answer is, there's a small amount of moisture present here. They get a little bit of rain every year, not much, but a little. Second, there is humidity in the air, especially in the evening breeze, like right now, you can feel it coming from the west off the Mediterranean, there's moisture in the air. That moisture, combination of the rain and the humidity, condenses or drips along the edge of these rocks here. And if you notice, right around the rocks, almost always next to the rocks, you get little tufts of green. Get one a moment. That's what we refer to as the green pastures. So the shepherd looks for a hillside. That's exactly what she was doing. Look at that flock across from us there. Just stunning. Those two shepherd girls have found a hillside that either was exposed to the wind or had that small amount of rain. And they move that flock across the hillside and it's one mouthful here, walk a step or two, another mouthful, another mouthful, another mouthful. Now that changes the green pasture image a little bit, besides the picture changing radically. Green pastures are not everything you need for the rest of your life. If you make that belly deep alfalfa, then what God is saying, if you follow me, I'm going to plunk you down and you'll never have to move an inch the rest of your life. Just reach out and grab it. Tell me that your life with God has been like that. Worry, said one rabbi, is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's pasture.
In the desert, you learn, the shepherd will get you what you need for right now. Ten minutes from now, you trust the shepherd. Just enough.